Hi, everybody. Welcome to session 3.8, uh, where we talk about budgeting. For this class session, I want you to show familiarity with basic budgeting practices. I want you to be able to demonstrate how to calculate program ratios, explain the differences in using marginal spending versus average spending to evaluate nonprofit financial decisions, and finally, describe why a focus on program ratios can limit nonprofit impact. So, talking about budgeting generally, the most important point I want to make is that budgets reflect strategy. Um, the the way you choose to allocate your resources because they're scarce is really determining what strategy you're going to pursue. And if you set your budget without deciding your strategy first, then your budget is deciding your strategy for you. And so, make sure that you are clear about what you hope to accomplish strategically before you sit down to to come up with a budget for the coming year. A few things I want to point out, some, some things about how budgets work for nonprofit organizations. Number one, most nonprofits account separately for operations and capital budgets. Um, basically, your ongoing operations should have a budget attached to them, and then any special projects should be budgeted separately. So if you're planning on building a new building, starting a new program, doing things that are outside of your typical operations, then you should be budgeting separately for that project. Uh, this allows you to make sure that your projects are on track. Um, another way that budgets are divided is by function and also by restricted funds. So functional budgets are budgets uh, broken up by department is another way to think about that, uh, meaning all your fundraising activities have a budget for them, your programs have a budget, anything else that sort of has a functional purpose within your organization, you budget for separately. If you're going to be budgeting, if you have restricted funds, I should say, then you should be budgeting for those separately, making sure that you are confident that you can describe where they're coming from and where they're going. Finally, a master budget is all those budgets added together, and that's typically what the leadership, like the board and the executive officers, would see. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that budgets should include both revenue and expenses. Most people encounter budgets just on the expense side because they're told what their budget is going to be for the coming year in their department, for example. And so if they want to make an expense that's outside of what's been allocated to them, then they have to get a special dispensation in the budget. But budgets should also reflect projected revenue. We're going to talk about projected revenue in a couple class sessions, but um, make sure that revenue is included in your projected budget. And if you're trying to figure out what expenses to include because you're building a budget from scratch, you not only want to look back at the way you've spent your money, but you should look at sample budgets from other organizations to make sure that you've covered all the expenses that, uh, that might come up. Some other best practices to talk about quickly. Uh, make sure you involve everyone that's relevant in building the budget. Don't have just one person do it, but seek feedback and have the board approve it. You should be budgeting monthly, not just over the course of a year, meaning you don't want to tell people, hey, you've got $20,000 to spend on this during the coming year. If you budget annually, then it can ignore cash flow. And you want to make sure that you have the money so that way if you give somebody a $20,000 budget, they don't blow it all in the first month. And then you end up hamstringed as far as cash is concerned. Make sure your budget includes a plan to save or reserve as much as possible. You don't want to be too excessive on that, um, but in general, you should make sure that you are s setting money aside as a reserve because for unexpected expenditures. Track performance relative to past budgets, especially deviations, so you can know that how you're doing relative to your budget. And a point that's especially relevant these days, make sure you rebudget when unexpected changes happen. Um, you may need to do a mid-year rebudget because of expenditures or losses in revenue that were not part of your original plan. So those are some general guidelines about budgeting. Um, there are a lot of sample budgets available on the internet that you can pull uh, and, and use as templates if you need to do some budgeting. Um, the best budgets are the ones that people pay attention to on a regular basis and not just something that's done once a year and then ignored. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about program ratios. Um, this is looking at the way nonprofits spend their money on programs versus other activities. And we've looked before at this part of a 990 together. Um, this is page 10, the Statement of Functional Expenses. And I've sort of cropped it so you can see the top and see the headers of each column. And then I've included what's at the bottom because that's what we're going to be doing our math on. This is the 990, the 2019 
990 for uh, American Red Cross. And so we're talking very big numbers here and that their reven their expenditures are in the billions. Um, <clears throat> if you remember what the pr statement of functional expenses does, is it requires the nonprofit to separate out their expenditures into three different categories of activity, and those are columns B, C, and D. B is any of their expenditures that go into their programs. C is their overhead or their management general expenses, administrative expenses, and then D is fundraising. And so the way we're going to calculate, we're going to use these numbers to calculate the program ratio. And the way we do it is we're going to be dividing total program expenses by overall total expenses. Or in other words, we're going to be taking line 25B and dividing it by line 25A. And uh, these are big numbers, but when you do them in a calculator, you get 90.4%, which is the program ratio that the Red Cross had for last year. Now, this program ratio is accurate insofar as the Red Cross has reported it properly. That's going to be true for every nonprofit. There are a lot of judgment calls that happen in the statement of functional expenses, and the Red Cross has actually been taken to task over this before. But even if we saw big deviation, even if we saw deviations in sort of what belonged where, as far as the statement of functional expenses is concerned, we'd probably be pretty close still to this this program ratio. Um, it's very common for larger nonprofits to have better program ratios than smaller ones. Um, smaller nonprofits still need certain administrative expenses, but because they're small, <coughs> those expenses become less efficient across multiple programs, and so. So it's pretty common for a large nonprofit to have a very efficient program ratio like this. Now we're going to take this program ratio idea and we're going to stretch it a little further by applying the concept of marginal spending. What a program ratio tells us is just average spending. And so by that I mean you might have a charity that spends $120,000 a year on administrative costs, $480,000 a year on program costs. That gives us an 80% program ratio. And that's useful information on its own. But what's more interesting is what is when we see what they do with new money. And so let's pretend that the charity receives a new gift of $200,000. Well, it has a lot of different ways it can allocate that money. Um, the one that is common is this one, where it's allocated on a per rata basis across admin and programs, such that they still maintain their 80% program ratio. Now, the truth of it is, and like I was just saying about the Red Cross, large, larger nonprofits typically have more efficient program ratios. It's rarely true that an in increase in program costs requires an equivalent increase in administrative costs. If you're undertaking a new program, it's usually not the case that an equivalent increase in administrative costs needs to occur to fund that program. It's often true that program costs require some increase in administrative costs, but not quite as dramatic. Well, there's a fascinating paper that it didn't make you guys read, but um, but I really enjoyed, which uh, looks at the way nonprofits tend to spend their new money. And they looked across thousands of, of reporting nonprofits and looked at, and they tracked changes in the way the nonprofits allocate resources. And what they found is this, is that for most charities, when revenue increases, both administrative and program costs tend to go up by the same amount meaning that nonprofits, when they get new money, when they grow in their fundraising activities, for example, or they have some new earned income strategy that brings in more money, they, they tend to grow their program and administrative costs at the same rate. But when revenue decreases, meaning when nonprofits see a drop in funding, what tends to happen is that administrative costs tend to stay the same, but program costs tend to go down. And I've mentioned this before, I think, in class, but the basic idea is that when nonprofits see revenue decreases, because the people making the funding, the making the budget decisions tend to be administrators, not program officers, well, the administrators typically keep their jobs and they cut the jobs of the program officers. And so most nonprofits respond to a, to a drop in revenue by cutting back on programs, not by cutting back on administrative expenses. Now, whether or not that is the right approach probably depends on the charity, but on average, I think we can make an argument that that should not be the approach.
Um, but you can kind of see why it happens because administrators are less willing to cut their own jobs than they are to cut programs. There is a way to measure this, and don't stress out when you see that equation because I'm not going to require it of you on a test or in an assignment or anything. I just wanted to show you how the authors figured out how to calculate this. They call this the marginal program ratio. And fundamentally, the equation is the difference between actual spending and the amount that maintains the ratio versus the change in spending that in excess of the amount that maintains the program ratio. And this is a way of looking at how nonprofits spend new money. It's a it creates what's it creates an index number, which means that the number only has significance in relation to the way that the money is being spent. Uh, and basically, it's a it's a number that's either a positive or negative. A negative NPR means that new money is going to be spent disproportionately on administrative costs, meaning admin costs will go up more than program costs with new money coming in. A positive NPR means the other. It means that program costs will get more of the money relative to administrative costs. I'll show you an example of this. So take the YMCA Chicago versus YMCA DC. YMCA Chicago, at the time that this uh, was measured, had a program ratio of 88%, whereas YMCA DC had a program ratio of 80%. Now that on its surface looks like the YMCA Chicago is more efficient uh, in spending their money on programs. Now that doesn't mean they have more impact necessarily, but that they're more efficient in allocating to programs. But if you look at their NPR, YMCA Chicago has a negative NPR of 1.53, which means essentially what happens is for every new dollar, the, the administrative costs are going to go up greater than the program costs. Whereas YMCA DC has a slightly positive NPR, which means when they get new money, slightly more of it is going to go to programs than is going to go to administration. What's interesting is if you were to look at this, and if you're a donor that only cared about program ratios, which I would advise against, but if you were, if you were a donor that only cared about program ratios, this creates a more mixed message than what you might have started out with, but looking just at program ratios. Because essentially increasing a don increasing your donation to YMCA Chicago will actually make YMCA, YMCA Chicago less efficient in their program ratio. Whereas a, a new gift to YMCA, YMCA DC will make YMCA DC on average more efficient than they were without your donation. Now, the, the reasons we're talking about this um, is because this should affect management decisions. I, you know, I don't, I don't want NPRs to be published to donors, for example, because I think that will just make them focus even further on the wrong things. But managers should be paying attention to this. When they, spend new, when they get new money, where are they inclined to spend it? And if they're not thoughtful about it, they will fall into the same patterns that we've already shown. Now, it may be true that some nonprofits need to reasonably keep their ratio constant to be effective, where an increase in program costs needs to come with an equivalent increase in administrative costs. But that's not usually true. And so a nonprofit manager should be thoughtful about that. If you're going to be using the NPR, it should always be used together with the regular program ratio. It shouldn't be used to replace it. And I should also say that an NPR based on just one year will probably be inaccurate because we're looking at it we're looking at how they tend to spend new money and that should instead be averaged across multiple years to show a broader pattern uh, new money that they, that they get in one year isn't going to show that the way they spend new money on average anyway i just really like this concept of marginal program ratios because it it, it ties much more deeply into the way decisions are made at the management level usually decisions are made in response to changes and changes in revenue are going to create decisions about what to do with programs. And I like thinking about how do we allocate our, our new money efficiently. Or if we lose money, how do we allocate what we have efficiently? And what the research shows is that administrators tend to prefer themselves, um, whether it's new money or a loss of revenue. And so I like introducing this concept so that my students think about this differently when, they get, when new money is at stake. But to wrap up, and I leave this for last because I want to really emphasize this point, when we're talking about program ratios and comparing them to impact, I want to make a really important point that program ratios should only ever be a management tool, not a donor tool.
Now, that doesn't mean you can stop donors from focusing on program ratios. It's, it sort of is like a, a, a level of sophistication that makes donors dangerous more than anything else. They think that they understand nonprofits well when they look at program ratios, but they, they're doing it with not enough information. All, and so a lot of nonprofits have pushed back against the trend of donors to use program ratios when they're making donation decisions. And they want to, and as a result, managers just want to throw out the program ratio concept altogether. But the reality is that managers should be using program ratios all the time because managers can use these to help them make budget decisions. And those budget decisions should always be prioritizing impact. But if you're thinking to yourself, okay, should we be spending more on administrative right now to increase our impact, or should we be spending more on programs to increase our impact? That's the right way to think about it, and that's where a program ratio helps you understand better what you might need to do. But again, to emphasize, you shouldn't be doing it so you sort of look pretty, and that's why you guys read that article about the starvation cycle. Because nonprofits that focus on a good appearance may be starving themselves in critical in ways that are critical to their health. And so a healthy program ratio, for example, would not be in the high 90s. Um, because that means they probably are underserving their administrative expenses, which means that really important things are not happening within the nonprofit. And that would be an example of where prioritizing administrative expenses actually increases impact. And another reason to have strong impact and to focus on impact in your decisions is that if you have better, if you have a robust impact and you can show that through measurement, then you're going to have better stories to tell donors than just a program ratio. A program ratio doesn't actually communicate impact. It's at best a proxy and a bad one, generally speaking. A lot of nonprofits can have very efficient program ratios and have very poor impact. But if you have good impact stories and then your program ratio doesn't look pretty, it doesn't matter because you can tell people about the impact that you're actually having and then donors are much more willing to trust you. Because again, fundamentally, donors just want the world to be a better place. And they may find their way through their donations clumsily to get there. But the nonprofits that do a good job of measuring impact and communicating that to donors are the ones who make it easiest for donors to get what donors want, which is a better world. And so as a nonprofit, you should be focusing on impact. And if you do, then you have really good stories to tell donors, and they'll worry less about your program ratio. So anyway, that's session 3.8, and I look forward to seeing you all. Take care.